Passport Mommy with Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is both amazing and difficult at the same time. The Passport Mommy, Michelle Gerson, is here to share in your journey. It's amazing. It really is just watching them grow and see how much change and how much they learn just without the filters around them. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Welcome to the show. I'm Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. I hope you had another good week. I hope you're staying sane. I hope you're staying healthy and enjoying the beautiful weather. If it's getting nice where you are, I know we have been getting out as much as we can. And every day is an adventure. I mean, really this morning, it was just a matter of how many business calls can I get in while playing with my kids, while wiping poop, while giving them lunch. It's just mayhem. But yet, I don't know if I want to send them back to daycare yet. So we're going to talk about that later in the show. But first, I want to tell you that I have Marshall Stevenson with me, my good friend, comic dad, owner of the New York Beer and Brewery Tour, which, by the way, if you're thinking about a last-minute Father's Day gift, what better gift than getting a gift certificate to the New York Beer and Brewery Tour? Because one day soon, you're going to visit New York if you're not living there already or you're not close by, and you're going to want to take this tour. So, Marshall, Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you. And thank you for the plug. We're not open right now, but we will be soon enough. So it's great for gifts. To, anyway, uh, yeah, so that yeah. uh, sounds tough with the poop and the describing the morning. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's the same every day. But, you know, I wanted to talk to you today about Black Lives Matter, because that has obviously been a topic that has been with everybody for the last two, three weeks. And I'm just wondering, we both have three-year-olds. How are you? Are you talking to your daughter about it? Because I have to say, I have not brought it up to my daughter because I feel as though she will learn. She will learn diversity in time. And I don't feel that this particular moment means I need to talk to her about it. And I don't really know if she'd comprehend. I mean, she has kids in her class that are black and she has a doll that is. And I just think like we integrate it, you know, just naturally. Right. So that's, uh, I think I agree with you. That's key. It's like, you know, same with uh, our three-year-old. She you know, the remote diversity, I'm not so sure what value, you know, diversity has with Zoom. But right. when they were in the classroom, there's just a tremendous amount of diversity. And uh, those are the kids who grew up enlightened on race, the kids who have some diversity in their lives. And that's not to say that you're bad if you live in a place with no diversity. But, you know, I live in New York City, you live in Connecticut. Um, I would say that it's uh, it's just really helpful to just if a kid, school's not diverse, go to a music class that's diverse, and then you really don't have to have these summits or these meetings or these let's take the top rabbi and let's take the top black <laughs> leader and have a summit. Like they you don't you just they'll just be friends if they start early. So I think that's right. You don't have to say anything unless they ask questions. Right, right, exactly. And so have you talked to your daughter at all about it? Has she asked any questions? Well, we talked to her about it because we actually went to a rally. Okay. So we went to a rally in a suburb. I mean, it was uh, funny or ironic or whatever you want to call it. There were no black people at the Black Lives Matter rally. Uh, <laughs> okay. So we went there. But that was all right. You know, that's fine. So uh, my wife and I are supporter of this cause. And we wanted to, uh, you know, make a note of that and be able to share it on social media and set an example. And we brought our uh, kid. So, you know, why are we going there? What are we doing? And uh, we didn't really get too far into it except just to say that some people aren't being treated fairly. And so we, uh, we were able to all get together and feel the same way and, you know, express ourselves but you know it's just like oh it's nice to be in this park a lot right. of people right right got it listen she, okay. she she every all the kids in her class are black and hispanic and when she drew herself she was the brownest person in the classroom <laughs> dark <laughs> brown so like what do you you know oh black lives matter cops that no i don't think so i don't think we have to say a word but i would be concerned if they were somehow exposed to it and were asking a lot of questions and you were with only white people. Right. What do you say right. then? 
What do you right. say then? Do you have any ideas? What do you What do you say? What do you say? I mean, I think you know maybe you get a book or you watch a video. <laughs> and you explain that there are different types of people in this world, different, you know, like the different cultures, different races, and you just start kind of explaining it that well, way. I mean, that kind of a video, like you watch, like, you know, some movie from a different place with different, that's not a bad idea. Or are you saying watch an instructional video? Like, this is how. No, I we think not- just like one that naturally incorporates people of different races, color. I mean, I, even if it's Sesame Street, I'm sure on Sesame Street or one of the shows like that, they they offer that, right? Even I know Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Miss Elena and Teacher Harriet, they're black, you know? So I think it's well, just naturally incorporated. I, I, it's funny. It's, you know, they did say, I did read something having grown up on Sesame Street that because they have... Uh, black and Latino and Asian characters in prominent roles that the kids look up to that they actually, the kids actually are less racist for watching that. So maybe mm-hmm. that's just what it is. Like, you know, they're not racist until they kind of get taught it or something. So uh, maybe just to, you know, continue to have them. If you don't have, if you're not, if you don't have any uh, diversity in your life per se or near you, then maybe it is just make sure you watch programs that have it. Yeah. We were watching frozen and then frozen Two. I didn't hear about any of this, but like the first Frozen was white, and oh, then yeah. the second Frozen had lots of black people in it. They must have like people must have complained. Oh, interesting, interesting. Like all yeah. of Arendelle, like you know, because I've seen this movie now. I think <laughs> it's, I think five hundred times. Oh in my the last gosh! Poor Marshall. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> well, it's made me a lot more you know empathetic to to needs of diverse populations watching this <laughs> Nordic <laughs> tale. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, speaking about diversity, you were saying that your daughter's school when she's there is normally very diverse. And I was telling you in another show that my daughter is on the waiting list for a very diverse school. So are you thinking about sending her back? I know that I was contacted about a camp that's starting up in a week. My daycare is opening in less than a month. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I would say in New York City, although the the trend lines are down, I don't think any like thing like that is open. I would be okay with uh, an overnight camp, but you know, three year old that's a little, a little young for overnight camp. But a day right. camp, like where they're going in and out every day with new people, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Have you asked uh, someone who knows something about this? I don't think <laughs> I would be comfortable with that. Yeah. I mean, when I spoke to them, they told me that they're staying within their group and there's probably only going to be six to eight kids in the group. But, you know, it's still, I don't know, part of me thinks, okay, let's just go on with our lives. And like, we need to get back to work. We need to do things I'd like her to enjoy. But if, oh my gosh, if anything happened, how terrible would I feel? Well, I I mean, there's, it's all a price to pay. I mean, the kids aren't in that much danger from this. And I know there are the new, whatever, there's a story about these kids who got this sick related to, but like, you know, there is a price to pay for not resuming normal life. I mean, I think these kids, if they spend another six months not hanging out with anyone are going to have social skill problems. So, yeah, I would say if you're comfortable with it being safe, I'll do it because there's a price to pay for not doing it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm really torn about that. We did have our first play date the other day. I had gone to drop off some clothes at a friend's house just for her daughter. And then she said, hey, you want to come in the backyard? And I was like, oh, I don't know. But then I was like, yeah, let's just do it. And it was great. Right, six feet and- apart or were they together? No, I mean, the the kids, they're together. You know, I could have been six feet apart from the other woman. But I mean, right away, her son went and hugged Eden and sneezed on her. And you can imagine, I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And the mother was like apologizing. And I was like, what am I going to say? But no, they were not six feet apart. Uh, well, I don't know. Our our, our uh, kid is, sort of understands the six feet apart thing. Like we oh, saw another good. kid she knew in the park and she knew to stand six feet apart from her. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if she yeah. knows exactly what six feet is. I mean, right. do any of us really know what six feet is? And, anyway, <laughs> you know, like when you're interacting, it's hard. So for a three-year-old, you know. Well, right. it was funny because we were going to, now we have a bubble with grandma. So now we can go to grandma's house. She can come here, but nobody else comes into either house. Oh, that's so good. So we're a bubble. Okay. 
So we right. go to grandma and that, but before that we were like, well, you can go to grandma's, but we're going to be, but you can't go to grandma's because you can't hug grandma. She's like, that's okay. I'll be six feet apart. Right. <laughs> and she okay. did it. Wow. That's great. And grandma hasn't gone grocery shopping or anywhere else. Grandma doesn't go grocery shopping. Grandma orders uh, online. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I See, mean, there's different. looking, there's some risk factors. I mean, we live in an apartment building. We get in elevators. Right, right. So there's some risk, but, you know, as long as we're all really, we're not socializing with other people outside of six feet. Yeah. Like you could take that family now and been like, whatever it is we have, we have it in common now. As long as you don't socialize with anybody else, we don't socialize with anyone else. You can start going to each other's houses. You can right, expand exactly. the bubble. I know. And I want to talk about this more. We're coming up on the break because the thing is like our husbands though are still working. So let's talk about that more. I'm Michelle Jerson. I'm here with Marshall Stevenson and you're listening to Passport Mommy. More coming up in a few. And don't forget, if you haven't checked us out on social, go check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Passport Mommy or the website PassportMommy.com. Drop me a line. Check out the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a review. That would be so helpful. All right. Talk to you more in a few. Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure. Here's Michelle Jerson, the Passport Mommy. We're here with Marshall Stevenson, good friend, comic, dad, and owner of the New York Beer and Brewery Tour. Go get your gift certificates for your family for Father's Day because you are going to be visiting New York soon. So we were talking about being in the bubble. You were saying, Marshall, that you've now expanded your bubble to include grandma. And we actually went over to my parents' house the other day, too, for my mom's birthday. And at first, we, I really thought we were just going to sing happy birthday to her from her backyard. And she opened the window. I drop off some stuff and we leave. But she ended up coming out. We were wearing masks. And I kind of felt I was a little worried because I thought, oh, gosh, you know, like I started going grocery shopping. I've gone out on different errands. They're going out. My mom just had surgery for for something that she's had ongoing surgery for. And, but, you know, I just kind of thought it, it's just a chance we'll take. And it felt really good to see family, but it is, it's a chance you're taking. Well, if you do the bubble, then it's not that big of a chance because, you know, if they're not socializing with anyone, you're not socializing with anyone, then you just have a big, like you can do that. Like I think a cousin of ours actually lives in California. They actually rented a house with another family. Oh, so that the smart. kids would be able to have a permanent play date. Yeah. But what if you do that and the kids don't like each other? Right. <laughs> it's like an arranged marriage. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, you were saying that in order to beat some of the boredom and being in so much, you got a new pet. Yeah, well, we got a goldfish. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, how do you get goldfish if you're not going to the pet store? You right. order them and they come in the mail, which is oh, already. Gosh. And of course, you know, when you order things online, Sometimes they don't come out exactly as you were expecting. Like you go to a store, you say, I want that goldfish. They put it in the thing, you take it home or whatever. So it's like, all right, goldfish. So it says half inch, eight to 10 half inch goldfish. Fine. 20 gallon tank, boom. 15 goldfish. All right. So that's a lot of goldfish, but that's all right. They're still pretty small. I mean, there's so many things that have gone wrong in this, if if you want to hear it, but Right away, two weeks later, they were an inch and a half. They were they were half an inch. Now they're two and a half inches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what what's going on? What do you feel? So the goldfish. Them? Meantime, we weren't able to get fil- do filters. So the fish. So I'm changing the water a lot. We got a couple of catfish put in there, and my daughter is watching the catfish. Oh, no, no, the catfish! Too many fish in there. Both catfish die. And all she wants to do is help the catfish. I think it's sick. I think it has a fever. She brings in her doctor's kit. And then we're oh, like, no. you know, so the catfish is in then on its back and floating around. We got to get out of the tank. She goes, no, leave it there. I want to make him better. I don't Aww. think so. Now, I'm sure this is what every, you know, this is a great thing. You got to talk about death now. So now I got my right. goldfish. <laughs> too many goldfish in the tank. 
the thing doesn't have enough filters, so it's getting so it's dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. I have to clean. I have to change the uh, water every day until the new filters come because we kind of finally did track them down. Right. Too many goldfish, and we had a death in there. And uh, and uh, she's, you know, finally we say, you know, the fish died. She goes, "That's okay." We, we, are you sad about it? She goes, "No, that's okay." Oh, <laughs> after all that, that's so after funny. All that. <laughs> so then, uh, I don't know, we're watching uh, Finding Nemo or something, which is probably the worst thing we could have done. <laughs> you know, we tell her something metaphorical about how the matter is going to go back into the earth and is going to be rebirthed to more catfish and things like that. And then the movie, <laughs> they flush the toilet, they reach the ocean. Well, this is totally, we just lies. Right. <laughs> I think we handled it all right. Although, does anybody need any goldfish? Because we have way That's too many so goldfish. Oh my and gosh, that's so funny. They're fine. <laughs> well, you taught you taught you got in some life lessons there, as crazy as it is. As crazy as it is, it was better than a dull day of doing nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. That's so funny. And it's like the things that we now enjoy as adults that we would have never thought about, right? Now that we have kids, we're like, oh, it's the simple things. We have to be inside. Let's get a goldfish. Or 15 now. Or 15 of them. One other funny thing is my kid, my three-year-old, is, is into the goldfish. She's very interested. But my wife and I are way more interested than she is. We right. sit there and just like, you know, just like hypnotic. Like I got things to do. You know, and I've just been completely derailed for the last two weeks. Like you say, oh, I got, I got a clean poop. I, I don't know what to do. I'm like at my wit's end. I, I don't know where to get any of my business calls. I've been completely right. derailed and distracted more by the goldfish tank than I ever was by the child. <laughs> I was getting, I didn't even appreciate how much I was actually getting done before I get the goldfish tank and then boom, nothing. That's funny. That's funny. See, so maybe everybody should get a goldfish. Forget getting a dog before you have a child. Just get a goldfish. Just one though. 15 is too many. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. All right. So we have about a minute left. What do you have coming up this week? I know you talked about taking a camping trip. We'll have to talk about that more in the next show. Oh, well, yeah, when we go on the camping trip. But we thought because the only thing scary with regard to COVID about camping is the shared bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So we decided to get our own cabin, which we could Clorox ourselves that's and so nice. uh, have a campfire and be near hiking trails and I mean, it's not totally without some risk, but it sounded good to us. Yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. Well, I definitely want to hear more about it in the next show because I'm dying to get away and somewhere safe with social distance. Definitely not staying in a hotel. And that just sounds like the perfect idea. Marshall Stevenson, thanks so much again for joining me today. Go check him out. New York Beer and Brewery Tour. Get your gift certificates. Coming up next, we're going to talk with Joel Marion. He has a book about why you should eat a lot after 7 p.m. Passport Mommy with Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. So one thing about being a parent is that I feel like all day you're just running, 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 doing, doing, doing for your kids. And you hear a lot of moms say that after their kids are in bed, they cannot wait to drink a glass of wine. Well, me, I go right to the refrigerator. And that's my time to say, ah, and I just start eating. And every night I think, oh, man, if I could have just not have done that. In the morning, my scale would have been a little lighter, would have been a little less. And then I get this book in the mail by Joel Marion saying, hey, it's okay to eat after 7 o'clock. In fact, always eat after 7 p.m. It's called the Revolutionary Rule-Breaking Diet that lets you enjoy huge dinners, desserts, and indulgent snacks while burning fat. Well, you had to imagine I had to have him on the show. So, Joel, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. For years and years and years, we have always heard, do not eat after 7 p.m., do not eat carbs at night, and that's how you will stay trim. But you're saying, nope, go ahead and eat. 
Yeah, and, and it was actually an accident how I stumbled across all the research studies. But over the last 15 years, there's been dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed published research studies. This is the gold standard of research. And I've cited over 90 studies in my book showing that people who consume their calories late in the day lose just as much weight as those who eat their calories later in the day. And in fact, people who eat their carbs at dinner time lost more weight and regulated their fat burning hormones better than those who ate their carbs earlier in the day. And then even uh, dieters who snacked before bed were shown to eat 397 less calories per day. Now there's a bunch of other benefits we can talk about, about eating later in the day. But the main take home point is, is that the research shows there's really no difference at what time you eat your foods. And in fact, the science shows that eating later in the day is actually better for your metabolism. It's better for your weight regulating hormones and it helps you burn fat faster. You just have to use the strategy I outlined in my book. Okay, so you did say one thing about you can eat your calories at night just as much as in the morning, but I guess what you can't do, obviously, is eat your calories in the morning and late at night because then that, that's going to be where you pile up the calories. Yeah, and I think that you're going to find that, you know, for the natural instinct of most of us, we're not really that hungry in the morning. It's just that we've been brainwashed to believe that we need to eat breakfast right when we wake up because it's the most important meal of the day. I was programmed to believe this through my nutrition certifications and even my college education. Um, but the research just does not bear that out. And if we really think about if we're going to skip breakfast, which is something that I teach people how to do in my book with a strategic way of intermittent fasting. And if you're using an intermittent fasting technique during that fasting window, the really the only thing that you're consuming is the fat burning drinks, which can be made at home, dirt cheap, you know, just fruit water, lemon water, apple cider vinegar, stuff like this. So you're really not consuming any food during this window. And if you're not consuming food, when you wake up, the food industry isn't making money. So if you really look, if you really follow the food industry, their goal is to get you to consume as much as possible from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, because that's how they make their money. So the right. idea of fasting took years to catch on simply because there's no money behind uh, telling people to fast. You're not consuming anything. So I think that's part of it, right? So. Got it. Got it. Okay. So what makes always eating after 7 p.m. different from all other of the hype diets, say, we see out there? Because we see a lot of diets where, hey, do this and you'll lose weight, do that and you'll lose weight. And I kind of have always been of the philosophy of just eat healthy and you'll be fine and don't do the dieting aspect. But this really isn't a diet, is it? It really isn't. It's more of a lifestyle. And I think that's the big advantage of this way of eating is understanding that all diets can and do work. The problem is the first three letters of the word diet, D-I-E, right? We all want to die thinking about a diet. And the reason why is because they limit choices. They sometimes forbid entire food groups like keto, no carbs. This creates deficiencies. It also makes it very difficult to adhere to, right? People say, well, what's the best diet to follow? Well, really, the best diet is one that you can hear, adhere to, and that was the inspiration for this book. And not only that, when you follow a traditional crash diet that forbids entire food groups, to sit here and think that you're not going to eat carbs the rest of your life is just not realistic. I created Always Eat After 7 p.m. because it's a doable plan. You can maintain it long term and still burn fat faster and the deficiencies and the lack of glucose from these diets like paleo and keto can lead to a hormonal decline in people over 40 years old. And it also leads to something called metabolic slowdown. So one week of using a calorie cutting crash, low carb diet, like a keto or a paleo diet, research shows that your fat burning hormones, leptin and thyroid hormones, both decline up to 50% in just seven days. So I've incorporated wow. something, something called super carbs into my program. So you eat your largest dinner at night when you are the most hungry instinctively, that's when you're the most hungry anyway. And we incorporate these super carbs because they give you the glucose, which is the building blocks of thyroid and leptin hormones. It's just knowing how to eat the right types of carbs and how to pair them and combine them with foods the right way so that you get a healthy blood sugar response. Right. So when you talk about those types of carbs, what are some examples? Well, we got to look um, right to nature. You know, any type of potato or sweet potato is going to be a great choice. Even white rice 
uh, which is often considered forbidden. I mean, we look at populations across the globe, like the Okinawas, the Catawba Islanders, the Tarahumara Indians, all these cultures eat about 60 to 75 percent carbohydrates. They eat their calories later in the day. They're the leanest, longest living, healthiest cultures on the planet. So this proves once and for all that carbs are not responsible for obesity and belly fat. With that being said, it really is more about the choices. So we're talking about beans and lentils and oats and potatoes and rice, things that are healthier carbs that have that glucose that are the building blocks of your thyroid and leptin hormones. And this also prevents something called metabolic slowdown. When you go on a diet and you cut calories, it takes about seven to 14 days and you get metabolic slowdown. This is why all the biggest loser contestants gained all or more of their weight back about a year after the contest, the majority of them gained all their weight back. And when they did studies on them, they showed that their leptin levels had plummeted to zero and they were burning seven, up to 700 calories less each day with wow. their resting metabolic rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's huge. And so, okay, so we're talking about not necessarily gaining the weight by eating late at night, but what about just overall digestion? I know sometimes if I eat a heavy meal before I go to sleep in the middle of the night, I don't sleep so well. And then I wake up in the morning and I feel like, Ugh, you know, <laughs> and I wish I hadn't eaten that before I went to bed. I think it's all about feeding your fat burning metabolism the right fuel right and i think if you're having those issues it's because you ate something that didn't agree with you and you would have had those same type of digestive issues whether you were sleeping or not and the research bears this out um you know a, a common misconception is at bedtime your stomach is closed for business or food eaten late at night mostly sits there and it's just simply not true the research clearly demonstrates that the digestive tract is fully functional and optimal during sleep and studies have looked at, in particular, consuming especially the macronutrient protein and a casein type of protein before bed. People who consume 20 to 40 gram servings of casein protein before bed actually gained more muscle than those who did not. Now, research also shows that snacking before bed, and I give you salty and sweet pre-bedtime fat-burning snack recipes inside my book from my great friend Diana Killian who is we call the recipe hacker so she gives you these delicious snacks that you can eat before bed they're they're heavier on the protein side because when you digest protein your body burns twice as many calories as when it digests fats or carbohydrates so mm -hmm. by consuming protein before bed not only are you feeding your muscle to gain more muscle you're actually helping your body increase its own metabolism before you go to sleep and then research shows pre-bedtime snackers actually wake up and have more stable blood sugar than those who skip that meal. Okay. All right. Very interesting. So you talked about the fasting in the morning. I know when I wake up in the morning, my rituals, I usually pour myself a little bit of water with a little bit of cranberry juice concentrate and mix it with flaxseed meal. And then I'll make a green tea. What are some of your fasting suggestions? Those are some of them. And you just got to be careful with the cranberry juice as long as you're getting a negligible, negligible amount. Yeah. And even black, you know, even black coffee's okay. I have a bunch of fat burning drinks inside my book that you can make that are pretty much calorie free. I mean, if there's under 30 calories, it's negligible. I mean, we don't recommend that you have cream in your coffee when you're fasting, but it's not going to be the end of the world or hinder your results that much. You just have to understand that when you're in a fasting window, lots of liquid is going to help prevent hunger pangs when you first start fasting. I mean, there's some people who wake up and they have to eat. Right. because of medication or they have blood sugar challenges. So we provide these smart snacks inside my book to help either A, show people how they can consume a high energy breakfast that will keep their body in a fat burning environment or B, slowly wean themselves off over the first two weeks of the plan so that eventually you're just using the fat burning drinks in the morning and then you're saving the majority of your calories for later in the day. Got it. Okay. And then when you talked about some of the meals at night that you can have, just tease us with an example or two. Oh, gosh. I'm thinking about the one pan spaghetti meatballs. Um, <laughs> so Diana has an amazing recipe where, you know, instead of using like breadcrumbs, um, she uses like cashew, ground cashew as the breadcrumb substitute. Mm -hmm. So she just, she takes these comfort foods, the favorite foods that we order when we eat out, the favorite recipes we want to cook at home, and she hacks them and substitutes healthier ingredients for them so you can still enjoy and indulge in these larger dinners at night and uh, burn fat faster. And in fact, the, the research shows that 
people who consume their carbs later in the day actually regulate their cortisol cycle because the glucose from these carbs coaxes the brain into releasing more serotonin and melatonin, and this induces deeper sleep. We all know that sleep's right. a huge part of the weight loss equation. Sure. So by having, by having these so-called forbidden, forbidden foods and hacking them the right way, you're actually able to burn fat faster. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And that is a huge plus with eating that way at night is that you are able to sleep better. And I find personally that when I eat a huge protein meal right before bed, I don't sleep as well as when maybe I add some of those carbs to that meal. The glucose is very important to induce the deeper sleep. There's no doubt. And the research bears that out. Yeah. All right. So tell me, where can people get Always Eat After 7 p.m., the revolutionary rule-breaking diet that lets you enjoy huge dinners, desserts, and indulgent snacks while burning fat overnight? Where can people get this book? When is it available? It's actually in bookstores now, so as soon as they slowly start opening, you'll see it on shelves. But to get a copy right away, just go to joelmarion.com. That's J-O-E-L-M-A-R-I-O-N.com. You can learn all about it, and then you can also get redirected to Biotrust Nutrition, which is my nutritional supplement company, and then I have a podcast called Born to Impact that you'll see on that website as well. Perfect. Okay, so we have two minutes left. I want to hear a little bit just about your background because we didn't really get into that at the beginning, and it's so much fun and interesting. Yeah, so it's interesting because when I first got into the industry, I wasn't married, didn't have kids, and wasn't running a business. I was just a college student. And um, I I actually uh, entered the Bill Phillips Body for Life Contest, which was the largest body transformation contest for regular people. It was a worldwide contest, had thousands and thousands of contestants. I think there was over 20,000 finishers. And I was fortunate enough to be selected as grand champion. And, uh, and, and back then, I mean, I was a little bit overweight, but the transformation was more about the muscle that I gained. And I think my metabolism, my hormones were a lot different. But what happened is when I did that contest, I discovered that if we focus just on having a healthy diet and we move more and we exercise more, that those little disciplines leak over into every other area of our life in a positive way. I found myself being more attentive as a son, as a college student, as a friend. And then, of course, this stuff started carrying over when I started Biotrust Nutrition. And I partnered with Josh Pizzoni about 10 years ago, and I was so dedicated to building the brand that I started pulling all-nighters and making unhealthy food choices. Well, at the same time, I got married, had two daughters, and the next thing you know, I was 46 46 pounds heavier. So I researched all the science that I use and always eat after 7 p.m., and I applied it on my own body first. And I ended up losing 46 pounds in only 16 weeks. And that was the inspiration for the book. Wow. Incredible story. And I remember when Body for Life came out and I was there in the gym following the book. Granted, I didn't enter the (laughs) transformation challenge, but that is amazing. Joel Marion, thank you so much for joining me today. Go get his book, Always Eat After 7 p.m., the revolutionary rule-breaking diet that lets you enjoy huge dinners, desserts, and indulgent snacks while burning fat overnight. Thank you so much, Joel. Oh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. More coming up in a few. Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Welcome back to the show. So, you know, while we're home during this pandemic, we're out, we're walking the dogs, we're walking in the streets with people. And something that I think a lot of us don't think about, but is something that postal workers think about quite often, are dog attacks. And when a dog gets on the loose or who knows why they might come after you and bite you. And that's something that a lot of postal employees do need to think about when they are delivering your packages every day. So today I have with me Chris Johnson. She is responsible for the U.S. Postal Service's safety awareness. She is the program manager and she is responsible for developing and implementing nationwide safety programs. Hi, Chris. Hi, good morning. 
Good morning. So tell me a little bit about what you are doing, what your uh, program is doing, just to make us more aware as people who might be dog owners or, and to also keep your postal workers safe. We have, uh, our program is National Dog Bite Awareness Week. We're going to hold it in June, second week of June. And we hold our dog talks we hold dog safety moments we do dog warning cards we have everything that we do all out throughout the year but right now we're focusing on customers and trying to get to ask the customers to keep the dogs either behind in their house or behind a fence to where we can deliver the mail safely and go on down the street Great. Yes, because it is, you know, your workers, they're out there, they're working hard, they're the essential workers during this time. And that's the last thing they should have to worry about when delivering packages and mail. Absolutely. If you keep the dogs uh, contained, we'll deliver the mail with safely and go home with the same um, non-bitten body that we left with. <laughs> right. <laughs> so tell us about the technology. That's all we could hope for, right? <laughs> tell us about the technology that the Postal Service is using to protect its workers. We have scanners, and the scanners will uh, alert me. I can input your address and say she has a dog, and as I'm approaching your home, my scanner will beep and tell me that you have a dog. So I'm already, I am prepared. Should your dog be out, I know you have one. Terrific. That's huge. Now, would you say mm -hmm. that dog biting is a serious problem for the general population? And do you have any tips for our listeners, especially those dog owners? Well, the, I, the tip I would first give to parents is please don't ask your children to get the mail from the mail carrier. Mm. because we don't know how your dog is going to react. Your dog may be very protective. So we ask that, you know, the parent pick up the mail. And just to keep your dogs uh, contained, either in the house or, like I say, behind a fence. Right, exactly. That's great advice. And what about just in general, when, say, we're walking? I know I walk with my three-year-olds, and then I have my one-year-old with me, and we're walking in the street, and there are dogs. And most owners are pretty good about keeping their dogs close, but others, they say, hey, do you want a pet? Or they just let them kind of go off on their own and bark and do their thing. Oh, those are the dogs that never bite, right? <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I, my suggestion would be to politely ask them to contain their dog. If they do, if you have a leash law, you know, please contain your dog. Put your dog on leash. Uh, take no chances. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, I used to live in New York City, and they do mandate that you have to keep your dog on leashes. And it would drive me crazy when people wouldn't, and they would be so far behind their dog as though their dog is perfectly trained, and they don't need to be next to them or even have them on a leash. And it would drive me nuts. Oh, absolutely. Dogs are very instinctive. They can be protective. You, we just don't know what they're going to do. So it's as a home, as a dog owner, it's your responsibility to keep them under control. Absolutely. So where can listeners go to find more information if they want to get tips, read more about what the Postal Service is doing and the technology that they're using? Oh, absolutely. I need you to go to about.usps.com and search dogs, please. Perfect. Chris Johnson, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate the tips. I'm Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Stay healthy and stay sane. Don't forget, you can head to the website, PassportMommy.com, to listen to this episode as well as any other past episode of the Passport Mommy show. You can also download on any podcast platform. That would be amazing if you could download the podcast, leave a review, tell us what you think, because the more reviews we get, the more people will see this podcast. And you can also follow us on social at Passport Mommy.